uh, flowing to them. All right. That's okay. Yep. Very good. Um, uh, and then just just to the to the west of that, the Des Plaines River uh, actually uh, originating in uh, across the border in Wisconsin. Um, it before it, uh, it it enters Illinois, it pays a toll and then comes down and uh, uh, enters Illinois and eventually meets up with the Illinois River further down off the map. This space in between is this very subtle subcontinental divide between the Mississippi River Basin and the Great Lakes Basin. Now, the first thing that humans, that European settlers did when uh, they arrived in the area uh, in the first uh, 20 or 30 years, I'm having, uh, it's hopping around on me a little bit here, is, um, go back one more, here we go, is uh, they decided that they needed to construct a canal between uh, the, the area that is now Chicago down to LaSalle, Peru, about 92 miles or so. And this was actually an important um, moment, uh, both biologically and hydrologically, as well as in terms of human population. Uh, this happened in about 1848 was when that canal opened. Uh, and as I said, it joined, what it did is it joined that Chicago River to the Illinois River and made the first connection between the two major watersheds. Um, it actually ended up driving a lot of pop human population growth in Chicago. And three years later, Illinois became a state. Um, this picture of this, uh, this uh, um, canal right here is in Chanahan, Illinois. Uh, now, this is an interesting location in that I'm showing it right here on, this, uh, on the map where my cursor is. I'm hoping you guys can all see that. Um, this is a confluence of the DuPage River, river, which actually the headwaters of that river, I'm proud to say, I grew up right in the headwaters of that river right there. And then uh, that flows south and joins. We've got the Desplaines River and the Kankakee. This was a really low-lying, fertile area where Native Americans resided for thousands of years before European settlement. About 50 years after that, another connection was made, and this one was a little even more important. That Chicago River, in terms of its outflows to Lake Michigan, was altered with structures, with control structures at both outflows as well as the Calumet. net. And what this effectively did is reversed the flow of the Chicago River so that the waters collecting from the north and south no longer flowed to Lake Michigan, but actually flowed down the Chicago Sanitary and Ship Canal and into the Mississippi River. In another series of physical alterations to this system uh, is the construction of the lock and dam system on the downstream portions of the Illinois River showing here on the left. Uh, these locks and dams are designed to maintain a navigation channel for the movement of, uh, of agricultural products between Chicago and St. Louis. Um, and on the right here, you can see the, the lock, and sy lock system in Peoria. Now, these are interesting. Uh, the, the Peoria lock and dam and the LaGrange lock and dam, the bottom two, are different than the rest and different than all the locks and dams on the Mississippi, and that they're wicket dams. And so in the bottom of the river are these large panels that get tipped up to um, hold back water during low, period, uh, low water periods. What you're seeing, seeing here is a high water period. And what that means is that the uh, river is free flowing. So unlike some other systems where fish passage is uh, hindered greatly uh, during uh, all periods of time. The Illinois River and the Chicago Canal. Um, and you're gonna, uh, uh, I'm sorry, uh, somebody, I was just here. I thought it was a question, but I guess not. Um, so during high water, it's open water. And so fish passage is, is obviously free. Now, all these connections have had uh, some, some impacts to the system. And, you know, one of the most obvious that I'm sure we're all aware of is the impact and the movement of exotic or invasive species between the systems and into the systems. And here I'm just showing you a few of the famous cast of characters, the rusty crayfish, uh, the round goby, Asian carp on the lower left, and the Asian clam. Um, it also has resulted in the delivery of excess sediment and nutrients down to the Gulf of Mexico, particularly because of the changes in land use, but also because of the connectivity and the change of flow and the increased flow coming from Chicago. And then the last set of major alterations, this is a, a rendering of an area near Havana, Illinois. It's in that last impounded reach of the Illinois River between LaGrange and uh, or upstream from, uh, it's called the LaGrange Reach. And in the early uh, 20th century, 
I want you to notice uh, in the center here, as I trace the Illinois River main channel meandering through the center of this large complex of backwater lakes, connected backwater lakes. Now, these are really interesting and important ecologically uh, in that they provided connection to a rising and falling river with the seasons. Um, uh, these places are important to uh, obviously fish, uh, using them as refuge from high rye water flows for, to find low flow environments. They're also important for reproduction and for nursery habitats for young fish. But as the need for agriculture expanded in the region, uh, there was also a demand for consistently dry or moist fertile soil to, and that, and that drove additional changes. And so after, uh, this, is, this is rendering in about 1918 or 1919, and just a mere seven or eight years later, um, it looks like this, where a series of levee systems have completely cut off all those backwater lakes uh, from the main channel of the river and have cut them off permanently. Uh, so they're, they're no longer there for the use of fish. And of course, as I said, these connections are important to juvenile fish, et cetera. So to summarize, within the first hundred years after European settlers, uh, we've uh, you know, made hydrological connections between two continental scale watersheds. We've installed navigation infrastructure, uh, flood control infrastructure, and our activities on the land have started to deliver a high level of pollutants uh, and large stretches of the river that um, made it devoid of fish. Uh, for uh, large stretches. And I'm gonna show you some data on that right now, actually. Um, this is from a paper that came out just a couple of years ago. Uh, and really uh, what it's looking at is, um, is the catch rate of commercial, uh, report of commercial fisheries catches in the Illinois River uh, from about 1955 or so. And as you can see, those alterations, which all happened in the first half of the 20th century, had a real impact on the amount of fish in general uh, that was appearing in the upper part of the river, the middle part of the river, and the lower part of the river. The lower maintained some, uh, some catch, but uh, in the first uh, part of that, uh, up until about 1970, you really saw little or no fish. Uh, and the anecdotes from the, from the true river rats that, that work in our organization on this stuff have told me that these little blips here are almost all common carp and invasive species. The first blue line here is the implementation of the 1972 Clean Water Act. And what this data is showing is after a lag period of about 20 years, you see the return of fish to the middle and upper stretches of the Illinois River. And we can see this reflected in 20 or 25 years worth of data on a program uh, operated by the US Army Corps of Engineers, the Long-Term Resource Monitoring Program. Um, this is a program that the federal government in, in cooperation with the states conducts extensive biological monitoring of the upper Mississippi and Illinois rivers. And what I'm showing you on the left here is a catch per unit effort of some of that sampling that they do each year in the LaGrange reach. Again, that LaGrange reach or the LaGrange pool is gonna be a center of focus of some of the studies I'll show you later. And on the left is long nose gar, and as you can see a very rather low and steady catch rate until about the year 2005 or seven, and then we see this increase. And we're seeing similar increases at the same period of time for short nose gar, uh, although in the last five to seven years, it looks like we're back on a decline for some unexplained reason. <clears throat> so what I think is interesting about this is that as we see just the pure number of fish return after the water quality improves, we also see improvements in these uh, native rough fish. Um, and I think the next point, the next phase of my talk here, what I'd like to focus on is the resource value of those native fishes. Um, in terms of the diversity of fish is, uh, in that LaGrange reach since about the mid nineties, it's been pretty steady, maybe a slight intake, some uh, uptick, but it's pretty, very, pretty steady throughout the last 20, 25 years or so. And I'm showing you a series of sport fish, what you would, re you would recognize as typical sport fish, but also in the center here, a freshwater dump, drum, which I would call, or what most would call a rough fish. And what we're seeing on not just the Illinois River, uh, but throughout uh, the Midwest, particularly in river systems, is anglers are becoming more and more interested in targeting not just these traditional game fish, but also these non-game uh, uh, rough fish uh, that are natives to these systems. 
We also see this happening in other parts of the center part of our country, particularly on GARS, which of course what I'm interested in. Um, and for example, here we see an example of trophy fisheries that are occurring in the Trinity River uh, where anglers are going out either with uh, hook and line or uh, with archery gear and targeting these really large and old alligator gar. And that fishery is certainly thriving. Fly fishermen are also getting into the act. Uh, so this is not gear specific to one particular kind of gear. We also see bow fishing, as I mentioned, as a key growth area in recreational fishing. Um, and this really uh, presents an interesting management conundrum in the sense that uh, unlike any of the other gears I've shown you to date so far in this talk, catch and release really isn't an option when you impale a fish with, a, with, a, with, a, with, a, with an arrow. And so uh, that's one challenge. The other challenge is this is a small but growing uh, population of anglers and uh, fisheries managers are not always aware of their existence in their local area, uh, nor are, are there easy ways to find them uh, to conduct creel surveys, for example. They like to fish at night. Uh, they are often, especially on the Illinois River, where we do have some backwater still connected to the river, they're tucked up in very remote areas in that system. And so it's difficult to get a handle on exactly how many, bow how much bow fishing is happening and how many there are. But if social media is any indication, uh, we see a lot of regular activity discussing uh, tournaments and competitive angling events. Uh, it's not just uh, your traditional white male angler that's getting involved. Women and uh, children are being recruited uh, to the sport. Uh, in large numbers with fishing clinics for young kids, et cetera, and that kind of that. And of course, I mentioned the tournaments uh, where teams are out on the river uh, targeting fit any, often any species of fish. And I'll get to what's being targeted here in a minute. Now, while this method isn't new to human history, it certainly uh, raises a couple important questions about how fisheries managers um, can deal with both a new group of species being targeted and a new method of fishing or new, uh, but emerging met, uh, mesh method of fishing. Uh, one of the things, if you think about recreational fishing that has been really um, emerging in, in the last 20 to 30 years is a conservation ethic that, that is rooting uh, a catch and release mentality. We see this in perhaps, you know, even in the most popular uh, freshwater sport fish in North America, largemouth bass, uh, 20 years of creel survey data. And we see uh, an increasing proportion of voluntary release of legal sized fish by anglers. And anglers are changing uh, in the sense that they're there for the experience as much as they are to put food on the plate or uh, fillets in the freezer in these, in these warm water fisheries. The last thing that presents a real uh, challenge for fisheries managers in this emerging fishery is the fact that gars are such, uh, so large, they are very long lived and slow growing and they are periodic spawners. And so these life history characteristics can put these fisheries at risk to over harvest without um, uh, informed management. <clears throat> Anglers, uh, to add to the, to the conundrum, so to speak, uh, anglers' knowledge of life history characteristics, characteristics of fish in general, such as the timing, conditions, and location of spawning aggregations, presents a technical advancement or a knowledge advancement, if you want to put it that way, that impacts the catchability uh, or, or the catch efficiency of anglers. And so what that can mean is an unregulated harvest of fish such as these large gar uh, can might result in rapid population declines. Uh, and in fact, that graph we saw a few slides ago, um, I have no just total speculation, but that would be a question we would want to answer to see if overfishing you know, uh, is, is uh, triggering some of those trends that we see. So I want to shift gears to the second kind of phase here before we uh, get to questions and answers with you all um, and talk about a couple studies that we've been doing to try to unravel and fill in a lot of the, the knowledge gaps that we have in terms of uh, gar ecology and life history. Very little is known about these, this group of fish. And there, uh, there, are, there are more research laboratories that are starting to uh, get involved in doing research on this group. 
but uh, compared to some of our other more popular and traditional uh, sport fish, uh, we know very little about uh, these, these creatures. Uh, three studies that I'm not going to tell you about today that we've been doing on the Illinois is a very large scale mark recapture study to try to determine absolute abundance of short nosed gar, or actually all, all three species of gar native to the system. Uh, we've also developed and enhanced uh, or uh, refined aging methods because these fish are so old, their hard structures are very difficult to determine age. And so it takes a lot of validation and, and trying of different methodologies and determining best structures to uh, use to be able to non-lethally sample these, these fish and determine age structure, which is a key component of fisheries management data. We've also got a, a, a swath of uh, genetic data on individuals that we've captured in the Illinois River, and we're uh, currently producing a data set on that right now. We're hoping to help have that, uh, hoping that data will help us understand the population genetics and the structure of, of short-nosed gar on the Illinois River. What I will tell you about are two studies, um, uh, a study about competitive bow fishing in Illinois, um, uh, and then one about acoustic telemetry. I got my bullet points wrong, but it's... So the first, the first here was a study uh, that uh, was done in our lab uh, by Sarah Molinero. She's a, a former graduate student of ours, now works with the uh, Indiana Department of Natural Resources. And she took a look at uh, bow fishing tournaments in Illinois for two straight, well, for two straight years on the ground, but four years worth of, uh, of data from the DNR. In 2015, the Illinois Department of Natural Resources passed a rule that any group hosting a competitive fishing tournament in Illinois of any type needed to apply for a free permit. And then after the tournament report, self-report uh, data about what was weighed in and caught that uh, during that tournament. And so we utilize that data to get a sense of what species of fish and how many fish were being harvested at bow fishing tournaments specifically. And while there weren't a large number of tournaments in the state each year, uh, 15, about 15 tournaments a year, statewide, we can see one real interesting pattern here. And that's here on the upper left in this bar chart, where we're showing just the number of fish that were harvested by those tournaments. Oops, sorry about that. Um, but they were harvested by those tournaments. On the left side uh, of the two couplets are all of the fish that were harvested. And on the right were just the um, uh, Asian carps, the big head carps and silver carps. And as you can see by the differential of these graphs, a large proportion, 85%, in fact, of the fish captured by these bow fishing tournaments were invasive species, okay? Compare that to a study on a 2018 World Championship Bow Fishing Tournament, Oklahoma. There, the trend was exactly the opposite. You can look at the non-native carps right here uh, and count up the 17% the of the total catch was non-native carps. Everything else in that tournament alone, it had hundreds and hundreds of acronyms, a really large tournament. They were targeting these native species. And so it's interesting to note that, to see how the system itself and the composition of the fish assemblage in part is driving what anglers are targeting in these competitive events. And this makes sense because these events are won by either the total pounds of fish that you capture or, or kill, or the numbers of fish or, this, or the uh, diversity of species that you capture. It all kind of depends on how the organizers set it up. This is the... <clears throat> now, just for, to put this in scale, in Illinois, uh, those tournaments that we talked about harvested about 61,000 pounds of, of fish uh, out of the river. Um, the Fish and Wildlife Service and, and the Illinois Department of Natural Resources work together each year to uh, do use electrofishing and netting in an intensive sampling effort to remove Asian carp. And they um, remove about 6 million pounds each year. And then Illinois has a commercial fishing operation that also harvests Asian carp and they harvest about 22 million pounds over, to, over about a four year span. So you can see that it's not making a huge dent in terms of managing for invasive species. Um, but it's, but it is uh, a, a small con uh, contributor. So that's data based on those uh, volunteer uh, post tournament reports from tournament organizers. If we go out on the ground of those same tournaments and interview anglers, 
uh, we get a very similar story. This is a picture of Sarah interviewing some bow fishing teams at the end of a tournament. She hit tournaments in all these places in Illinois, most of them on the Illinois River system, but a couple on the Kaskaskia River system, which also flows into the Mississippi, and then one on an impounded uh, uh, Corps of Engineers reservoir. <clears throat> and if we look at what's uh, look at the harvest comparison that, Cara, uh, that uh, Sarah determined, it's very similar. It's that 84% of carp and then just about a 15 or 16% of native species. And they're catching these carp at a much higher uh, rate in terms of their catchability than they are these other fish. We're still interested in this group of gars that are getting harvested because uh, sometimes, like I said, the, the, the prize structure of the tournament can dictate uh, composition of the catch. Uh, if we look at the size structure of the fish that were captured out of those tournaments, we see that for short nose gar in both locations, a tendency that larger fish are being captured when compared to a standard sample of the population and size distribution at the bottom panel here, and the same in the upper reaches, although not as statistically significant as this one, as the, it was in the Lagrange reach. And similar for no long nose gar, um, the larger the gar, the more likely it's going to be captured. And we're going to see um, a disproportionate number of large uh, uh, fish being captured out of the population, which of course is gonna have implications for future reproduction. Now, interestingly, this is, a, I think, a real neat insight as to the growth of the sport in general to see where these people are kind of coming from in terms of uh, their, their participation in this activity. The first thing I want you to see is that if we look at these two categories on the right, these are anglers participating in tournaments who indicate they also participate in other bow or archery sports and then bow or archery and rod and reel sports. And so these are people who are expanding a sport that they are already doing uh, uh, to expand their archery use. But then if we look at a different combination and we look at these two categories here, these are people, this 25% and this 6% combined, 31% uh, of participants have never fished before when at tournament. So the archery is actually the entry into fishing in general for about a third of participants in these tournaments. So if we're gonna to try to understand size structure of these fish and how anglers are capturing in them, it's important to understand uh, as we consider management strategies, how the population is structured uh, to apply those strategies at the appropriate spatial scale. Um, are these isolated populations that don't move around the system very much, or is it a very large panmictic population? And that's part what the genetic study will tell us, but also, this acoustic telemetry study that we worked on. And so um, we focused on the LaGrange Reach, which is between uh, 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 Beardstown, or this is where our study site is in Beardstown. This is Havana, Illinois. Uh, and so we won't focus on that stretch there. And in that stretch of river, uh, we were able to internally uh, uh, implant acoustic telemetry tags in 40 GAR uh, in June, September, and August of 2018 and 19 at these locations these two backwater complexes, Lily Lake and Treadway Lake. And this is the main channel of the Illinois River coming down here. Now we were able to do that surgical implantation because if you're, if, in case you weren't aware, uh, gars uh, have these ganoid scales and they are very thick. Their body, uh, it almost creates a, a body armor and they're not easily breached or cut with a scalpel, which is how we would typically um, insert uh, a tag into a, into a telios. And so instead we used, um, we took off of an idea that uh, John Midway had in a paper he pr published on long nose gar, where he used a rotary blade Dremel saw on an anesthetized gar to cut the incision and make the, and, and implant the tag. Uh, now he had reported that that is how he had did it, uh, done it, but it hadn't been tested as a, for its efficacy. And so we spent about a year and a half monitoring about 40 fish in our research ponds for uh, mortality um, uh, after doing sham surgeries and demonstrated that not only is this technique viable for field implantation of tags, but we also demonstrated that the use of Acquiesce, which is our eugenol, which is a 
rat, uh, immediate release sedative for fish is uh, usable for gar as well, which is really helpful. So we had a, a, a stationary uh, receiver array deployed each season throughout this study uh, stretch. And that's shown by the dots here. But we also were able to supplement that with receivers on a larger scale from other projects happening in the river. Asian carp are monitored in the same way to track their movements and advancement towards the Great Lakes up the system. And so we are able to use a USGS uh, database uh, clearinghouse to gather tag hits of our fish on other receivers. And that's, so those tag hits are gonna be the genesis or the origin of the data I'm about to show you. We were able to use this data to basically determine that there were three kind of behavioral types of short-nosed gar in this reach of river. Now, the first group on the left I've got boxed and we're calling the homebodies. So these fish had a large number of detections overall, which I'm not showing here, but at the top, the distance between the furthest two receivers where they were detected at least five times or more is very low, which means the receivers were close together and that fish never really left uh, that small area. And there's a small number of unique receivers visited. So these two pieces of information indicate a fish that is moving around, but is not moving very far and staying very close to home. Now, if we compare that to this other group on the other side of the graph, these non-resident fish, it's a very similar pa pattern to the homebodies. We have a small number of, a, a small home range, excuse me, maximum distance between the two furthest receivers. And we have a small number of unique receivers uh, visited. But the difference here is that we have very few detections. So these are fish that came into our array only briefly and then vanished again. And then lastly, in the middle here, we have this third group, this migratory group. And these are you know, significantly different than these other two groups in that their distance between two furthest receivers is much greater, in some cases over 100 river kilometers. And their number of unique receivers detected is much greater. So they are moving all around the system. So this has real interesting implications in terms of deciding how to implement any management actions uh, for this population. Uh, and what it tells us is, um, let me back up a second and show you that map again, is that we cannot be treating fish from Lily Lake as a Lily Lake population or Treadway Lake as a Treadway Lake population, but rather we, whoops, we need to be thinking about uh, this short-nosed gar population is ranging much longer and wider down the river and looking at uh, geographically uh, wide uh, management actions. So the take home for the, what I've shown you so far before we get into the uh, question and answer period is that it's clear that recreational anglers are changing their tactics and their targets in terms of uh, their, their recreational fishing activities. And as resource managers, the traditional focus on sport fish and the ignoring of or the lack of attention to rough fish or trash fish uh, could put some of these uh, linea ancient lineages of fish at risk over time. So the question that we're really faced with was how must, we how must the approach to managing recreational fisheries change? And I think several of the questions that students provided before uh, today's session really point at that. So I think now is a really good time for me to pause and uh, give you all and say thank you for your attention and we can engage in a little uh, Q&A and conversation. Hi, my name is Kiara Dennis. Hi, Kiara. Um, yes. My question was, do you think revamping the image of guards and dolphins as indicators of ecosystem health and palatable food sources will be enough to destigmatize game slash non-game fish ideals and subsequent fishing policies? Yeah, I, I, I like this question. And there was actually another one that I, in my mind, I kind of put um, in, in a similar category. I'm going to share my screen again and move ahead to a, um, uh, a slide I've got here. Uh, there we go. Oh, I think it's one more back. Sorry, I'm just looking for this real quick. Here we go. 
it's about the revamping of fish. So, so I think this goes to the question of how do we impart value in native fishes generally, not just sport fishes, but native fishes. And I think over the last many decades, I think the, the general story of ecosystem health is important. Um, you know, uh, restoration is needed where systems have been severely altered and degraded. These are things that I think uh, your average citizen would accept, right? But I think what's interesting about this question is if we think about what management, research and management and the role that it plays can do to um, enhance that, 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 um, the gains that are made just on the intrinsic value of a fish living in the water because you think it's cool or because uh, it was here when the dinosaurs were here. You know, those are nice reasons for people to care but I think it takes more than that. And so the first part of this slide I wanna point you to is on the upper left here. And really what this is, is this is the model uh, with which in, the, in North America that we primarily manage fisheries. And it starts um, in, in large part with the sport fish restoration program. It's a federal program. So when anglers or boaters purchase fishing licenses, uh, et cetera, they are taxed and that goes into the federal coffers. When manufacturers make fishing rods and fishing line and things like that, they get taxed and that goes into the coffers. And that, that money is then available and doled out each year to the states by the federal government. And it's doled out proportionally to the number of license sales that they sell. And then those agencies, those state agencies can utilize that money to manage fisheries. And they can do that for things like building boat ramps and providing more access, but they can all, or improving habitat, but they can also fund researchers like me to ask important questions to get answers that they need to make informed management decisions. Now, uh, a paper just came out on this subject uh, by Skarnecchia, who wrote another paper about 25 years ago about GAR. Uh, I think I, that's the one I sent to you guys to read. Um, they're arguing, and I agree with them, that this program only rest restricts activities to a, a certain list of sport fish. And these native rough fish that anglers are targeting are not included and are not eligible for this funding. And so there's no mechanism for agencies to be able to invest in substantially the amount of uh, research is needed to understand these, 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 these fisheries. And so changing that game so that smallmouth buffalo and short-nosed gar and some of these other species are eligible for large-scale research projects that can uh, answer questions in a form management is really important. I think it's, uh, what I find really interesting is the schematic that they use on the lower left of the screen here, where you look at um, the difference between catchability and vulnerability to capture on the x-axis, and we have sport fishes and imperiled fishes, and how they're arguing basically that when you get into this native non-game fishes range, there's no, there's insufficient funding to uh, monitor and track and manage these uh, groups of fish. Even if um, the social value of any one of these fish might be going up into this sport fish range. So that's a policy change that they're calling for. And I think is, is a, is a well-reasoned one. But thank you for your question. All right, I'm next. My name is Patrick. And my question was, what work has been done with angler organizations to promote better ecological practices? Thanks for that question, um, Patrick. I appreciate it. Uh, angler groups are... Uh, a, are kind of one of those organizations that really is localized in terms of how involved they are and how much of a connection there is between either research groups like mine or uh, management agencies like the DNR here in Illinois. I know that in Illinois, the DNR spends a lot of time meeting with and listening to angler groups and, their, uh, and what they see happening on their individual lakes. Um, and so, but the, you know, to, 
the role of those angling groups to improve the val or in, uh, change the perceived value of these native fishes really depends on whether the angling group is targeting them because if they are a group that is like a bow fishing group um, and are because there's a there's a big bow fishing group in the state of Illinois that works really hard to communicate to their members and to the public via social media that they target invasive species recipes for grass carp and I caught all these, uh, you know, these uh, big heads to last night, and big pictures that they're very focused on that. And they're very focused on what gar they do catch or what natives they do catch, they utilize. Um, one of the big issues with, with um, bow fishing in general is the reputation of wanton waste. And there's, it doesn't take many really bad examples to a reputation to kind of take hold. And so I think in terms of bow fishing in particular uh, and native fish, Tar uh, anglers who target native fish more generally, it's an, it's kind of like early stage of the game in, in a way, you know, relationships are being built, connections are being made, but there are speed bumps along the way. And so I think a robust role for angling groups in driving management decisions in that realm is probably a little ways away. Um, unlike a bass club, which, pro which has a much more, uh, typically has a very close relationship with the local biologists, Musky clubs spend money to stock musky in local lakes, so they're there to fish. They, they invest their money in management in that way. And so uh, probably just a, a, an evolution of that relationship over time is, would be happening in my mind. Tracy uh, put a question in the chat that's related to this. Um, yes, <laughs> hi. Uh, that's a really great question. Yes, user conflict is an issue. Um, and it's not just angler to angler conflict on the rock river in Northern Illinois. There's a lot of bow fishing at night that's happening and it's rather populated there with uh, homes along the riverfront. And you can imagine the sound of a generator powering, you know, a dozen or more 3000 lumen each lights moving along the shoreline, you know, right where your dock is at night, uh, shooting, you know, cheering when you get a big one and all that stuff, it's quite disturbing. So yes, even that kind of user uh, impact, user conflict is, is a real issue that needs to be managed. Um, uh, in, in terms of tournament angling, that's always a, pro always a challenge that needs to be managed. And one piece of that permitting system that's in place here at Illinois is not only is there a review of each permit for biological impact of the, of the effort of that tournament, but site use impact. So Theoretically, if all goes well, you wouldn't show up for your tournament, your fishing tournament in Illinois at the boat ramp, only to find eight other tournaments also trying to show up there at the same time. That's that's prevented through the review process. So, um, so have you done any studies looking at besides knowing that there are new anglers or they're already hunters? Mm -hmm. Do you know if they're the same people who were doing the rod fishing? Are they coming from farther away? Are they spending more money in their local economies? Um, yeah, these are questions we just don't know. Um, Illinois stopped doing creel surveys in general in 2010, and so oh. we don't even we don't even have uh, we have some small targeted creel surveys that other research groups are doing. But in our research group, we ran the statewide program for a couple decades, and uh, it got defunded in about 2010, and so we just stopped. So there isn't. There isn't really a statewide annual creel survey in Illinois um, to generate the kind of data you're asking about. There is on Lake Michigan, but not on the inland lakes. Okay, because um, yeah. we had, uh, I've done several uh, economic surveys coupled with creels in mm. Oklahoma. And um, for instance, I did two different trout survey uh, surveys and the population between one of the mitigation fisheries and the other was entirely different. Um, there were actual women in the one in the South and um, they came from much farther away and it was a more quality fishery. So yeah. um, the bow fishing is something I've never done. Um, it, it just, the population seemed so very different for species, for types of fishing. Um, in my experience, the bow fishing is a really interesting question to me. So I, I... I don't have the, uh, Sarah did run some general like zip code distance traveled to these tournaments and stuff. And we did get some out of state 
you know, travelers hundreds of miles to come to these tournaments. Um, but not a large amount, but the, but it wasn't lo- they weren't localized tournaments either. They were definitely regional and in, in the in, in state, but regional within the state. So people wow. are aren't moving around the state to go to these tournaments because there just aren't that many of them, and it's a really close knit community that's tied okay. together virtually, basically. You know, that data would be fun to run for class to do a zonal travel cost survey. Oh yeah. We should touch base. Be happy to work with you on that. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Hi, Dr. Stein. My name is Chris. Um, And my question was, what role do GAR play in fishery management? And can those species be used as an indicator of a healthy fishery? I think the second, the answer to the second part of your question is absolutely yes. I mean, I think that's true of most native fishes. They're a top predator, okay? So um, they're gonna be uh, indicators in that way. They're not particularly sensitive species. Uh, I, I hope that's apparent. If you've been here since the dinosaurs, you're pretty tolerant to a whole lot of stuff. And so um, that's really not the issue, but their presence uh, is important in the sense that they have those kinds of top-down effects that, that top predators have in terms of controlling abundance of prey. And so um, you will see maybe not an indication in gar, uh, you would see a, a cascading uh, signal as gar depleted in a population and you would see ch- ch- ecological changes throughout the food web in that sense. Um, and the first part of your question, I apologize. Um, I want to repeat that or I can find it on the screen here. Yeah, it's a, what role do guard play in fisheries management today? Ah, okay. So um, most jurisdictions don't have restrictions on gar harvest. And so uh, they don't, they aren't really managed the way largemouth bass or walleye might be managed. And so that's kind of uh, the point of uh, Skarnecki and, and, and colleagues, their recent paper, Andrew Reipel wrote a paper about a year ago, I think now, uh, kind of on a similar, you know, topic. And that is these, these non-traditional target species need some attention, you know? So that is a, that is a growth area, uh, the need for growth in terms of research and management. <clears throat> I, I have a, Jeff, this is Sandra McVaughn. I have a question about water quality, but first I know Rebecca Clapper had a question in the chat that I'm also interested in. Oh, um, yeah. Were there differences in movement among fish tied to sex or age in that home body versus migratory? Yes. Uh, not, that, not that I recall. Um, I don't think there was a sex difference in that, but we're still working that data up. That was a that data you saw was a presentation we were going to give at the AFS meeting two weeks ago. So um, that's like hot off the press. And so, and, I, and, 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 and the lead author on that paper, I just got a text this afternoon is uh, off to the delivery room for her third kid. So we may not have the answer to that for a couple months. <laughs> How about the age structure? Age structure um, on the ta- on the tax on the fish? movement. Yeah. On the movement. Yeah. Yeah, uh, that's another one I'm going to have to defer. I apologize not knowing that. I don't know that Sarah's looked at those 40 fish. 40 fish is a kind of a small number, yeah, small. Yeah. especially, you know, for fish that could be anywhere from six to 18 years old. You're going to yeah. get, you know, not a lot of resolution there, I think so. And I forgot, when do they become reproductive? Early, uh, four or five years. Oh, okay. Yeah, yeah, I was just wondering if that would affect your population genetics, et cetera, that you were talking about. So, mm-hmm. yeah, all of the fish that we uh, we actually took fin clips on the fish we tagged, so they're mixed into that genetics data as well as additional fish, but yeah. all adults. Um, yeah. Hey, and uh, I know Sandra had a question. My other question in the chat was, how do the hunting and fishing shows affect the perception of people uh, fishing for gar, especially the bow John- hunting? Yeah, John so and I were talking shows now that are yeah. targeted towards, you know, fish and big fish like that. Yeah. So not, I don't, I'm not getting a sense that here in Illinois, that's a real big factor, but boy, that alligator gar trophy fisheries, in Texas and Oklahoma, they, they are shining a big public relations spotlight on these, <laughs> like kind of like these lifetime trip. Right. Yeah. I'm going to I'm going to drop a couple thousand dollars. I'm going to yeah. pay a guide. I'm going to the Trinity River 
and I'm going to get a picture with this guy, you know, yeah. and you, guys need, um, you need a fishing show. Yeah. <laughs> right. <laughs> right. Yeah, it's true. Um, I think, you know, for the big concern ethically, me personally, that I have with that is lethal uh, capture. Like, you know, especially those big beasts that the alligator gar can, an individual might spawn once every 15 or 20 years in an 80 year lifespan. And, you know, it just, That's it amazing, just makes, yeah. yeah, it just makes me really uncomfortable to think that we might just kind of be trophying those guys. Yeah. Uh, I can in a direction that. we don't want to take them, you know, and yeah. after all that. They, they've, they've they've handled themselves so well for millions of yeah, years. Yeah, right. They've lived that I, long. Yeah. I don't want that legacy on my shoulders. So yeah. you know, I, I would prefer uh, non-lethal methods for sure. Yeah, that's my preference. Anyways, I know Sandra had a question. Sorry, Sandra. Yeah, yeah. No, yeah. no. This is super interesting, and it is kind of like cutting down a really old tree, right? You always feel bad when you have to take down an old tree. You don't want. You don't want to go log your forest. Um, mm -hmm. Hey, I, so Jeff, I'm not a fisheries person. I'm actually more of a microbiologist, but the, this talk was really interesting. And especially the beginning where you're talking about reversing the flow of the rivers. I did, I missed one part of your talk though, because of some commotion in the kitchen and some pots and pans <laughs> behind me. Um, but I'm overall, I know there was just a great deal of pollution probably until, you know, the, 80s with mm -hmm. coming from Chicago. And I know that yep. probably just took it all the way down to carp. At what point did you see kind of um, the fish diversity and some of these native guys from those outlying areas come back and populate that main stem of the river? Yeah, that was, uh, I was, I want to say early 90s, but I'm going to pull up the figure and show you. Yeah, thanks. Yeah. And then the second half of my question is um, from kind of those smaller one. areas that are probably less polluted, how much did the mainstream uh, main stem kind of recover? I mean, did you get 50% of what's in the more pristine areas seeding it or did you get 100% and then will we ever get there? So what, the, yeah, I, I, I actually can't, I don't know the answer to the backwaters and tributaries serving as a source or sink for the main stem. I, I don't know if um, Dan's paper, the one I'm showing you here, cover, I can't recall if it covered it to that extent. Um, this is all, um, you know, this, I'm gonna, uh, if I, my memory is correct, these data are for the entire section, tribs and main stem together, okay. right? And so you can see the upper, you're not really seeing any blip until mid nineties, right? Where you start to see these guys in the upper river show up. You see a little bit in the mid, the late eight, early to mid eighties, but really again here in the middle stretch of the river, not until the second half of the nineties into the two thousands. And of course you see something, you might see a slight uphill there, uh, a lot of variability, but still fish. So, you know, the presumption is that the lower half of the river served as a source to recolonize back up the river once water quality conditions improve. That's, that would be my, that would be my uh, hypothesis on that data. Well, and it's interesting that it's kind of the same benchmark and John can correct me if I'm wrong um, of what happened in our Menominee River that was like just mm. incredibly sewage impacted. And that mm. coincided with just a huge investment in, um, you know, sewage treatment and, and just money influxing yep. into cities so they could handle yep. things. So it would be, it would be interesting to see if that's a, a pattern around the country, the investment in that water quality to see that, that big jump up. And then the second question I had with the garfish being so old, 80 years old, are they ever used as kind of um, bio indicators for accumulated toxins? Yeah. yeah. Um, uh, let's see. I got to remember it was the guys in Texas at um, Heart of the Hills. Um, Dan Doherty and those guys, uh, they collected a really old alligator gar and they did uh, a nuclear bomb. They could detect the nuclear bomb testing of the 1950s in the hard structures of their, uh, of those fish. Wow. That's really, that's really good. Yeah. It's actually one way they used to ver validate their aging. Wow. Cause they, cause they had, cause they had this, they had this fish and they had other, they had more than one 
uh, fish around this time. And they were able to, just like you would like a oxy tetracycline mark or something like that. You, you can, you can immerse a fish in oxy tetracycline and it'll make a fluorescent mark like a ring on a tree and its ear bones and then its fin rays and stuff. And so if you know when you did that, like a, it's like a, I know that was 1982. And same with the nuclear tests of the fifties. Those are, that's commonly used in biology in old stuff to, to, to help age and date things. And they were able to do that with alligator gar with some of the fish they had. Yeah, well, that's really interesting. I think they did it with the, there was a 98 or a hundred and some year old big mouth buffalo, buffalo too, that was captured. And I think they might have done it with that one too. That's an old fish. Yeah. yeah. Great talk. Yeah. Thanks. Thanks, Jeff. Yeah. No, thank you. Other questions? Hi, um, this is Emma from the class here. Um, so one of the papers Hi, Emma. that um, you had us read for this week for this um, talk was it mentioned um, fishery induced evolution. Yeah. And I was very curious about that term because I think when you think about evolution and then you think about fisheries, it's like this evolutionary time scale versus a relatively, in my mind, newer kind of phenomenon of fisheries. Mm -hmm. So what does that mean and how does that happen? You bet. So fisheries-induced evolution is actually a subcategory of something called human-induced rapid evolutionary change, H-I-R-E-C. And the idea is that humans change, is this, this is kind of one of the hallmarks of the Anthropocene, right? So um, the, in fisheries-induced evolution, what happens is capture of fish is biased towards some set of behaviors or age structure or some other life history characteristic to the point that it exerts a selection pressure on the population and leaves behind uh, different behavioral types, physiological types, et cetera. So I'll give you, I'll give you an example from largemouth bass. Um, in our lab for 20 some years or more, we've been studying this phenomenon in largemouth bass. In the late 1970s, my predecessors, I was like nine at the time. So I, was, I had no idea this was happening, but they um, utilized a wild population of adult largemouth bass to set up an experiment in which they put, uh, I wanna say 3000 fish in a 15 acre impounded lake south of Champaign here. It had a control structure and it had a complete um, uh, closure of the fishery except by appointment. And if you fished, you got a complete census of your catch. So you'd go out on a boat that was provided to you, you'd catch a fish, you'd put it in a live well, you'd tip up the flag, the clerk would come out, measure the fish, mark the fish and release it, okay? So they marked all these fish and they angled them by the public in this method for like three straight years. And they got catch histories on every individual fish. And they were able to drain the impoundment and collect all those fish. And they put the fish in two groups. Uh, one group were fish that were caught three or more times over the course of two years or three years or whatever it was. And others that were never caught or caught once. And they took those adults and they bred them separately. The high vulnerability of the fish, the fish that were caught three or more times, bred with each other, produced offspring in a, in a, in a uh, uh, experimental pond situation. Same with the low group. Did that for four generations and then tested them for both their angling catchability and for uh, over time, over more generations, physiological and, and metabolic and behavioral characteristics. And the long story short is fish that are more catchable in large, large mouth bass more catchable, are larger adults who are more aggressive, okay? Which happens to be the characteristics of those fish that provide the best parental care. And so large mouth bass spawn in the springtime and the males guard the brood. They build a nest, court females, they spawn, and they guard and, fertilize, and fan the fertilized eggs until they hatched independence. The dads who are best at being successful at that are the largest dads, are the uh, most uh, metabolically active dads are the um, most aggressive dads uh, and are the faster growing dads. Imagine doing that over generations of population and you can suddenly see how you would end up with a group of uh, a population of largemouth bass that aren't aggressive, that aren't good parental caregivers, that are metabolically uh, deficient in some way, 
uh, who have uh, higher higher resting heart, uh, or respiration rates and things like this. These are all correlated uh, stress response, all this sort of thing. And so you can see how that imparts an evolutionary change that is rapid. Um, we are still um, um, husbanding, husbanding, brooding uh, these generations of acid our research ponds now. We've shown growth differentials and survival differentials in offspring. So we did another series of experiments where we had not only the pure line of fish, but we had F1 hybrids. So offsprings that were the result of parents that were pure highs and the uh, offspring that were a result of the parents of pure lows. We grew them to be adults. Then we had them, we had high males and low females mate, and we had the reverse mate, and we created those offspring, the F1s, and we back crossed them and did F2s. And then we put equal numbers of pure line fish, juveniles, uh, F1s and F2s in both directions, all six groups, and grew them up for three years and differential survival, differential growth. So you could see how fishing during the nesting period for largemouth bass is a selective force on the population that changes the physiological and metabolic and behavioral profiles of these fish. And that I think is how I would answer the question of what is fisheries induced evolution? Okay. Okay. Um, any questions about that? Does any, did I confuse you? I hope not. I've got no, I've got no visual feedback. Oh, I'm just staring at John's sense. mounted guard. <laughs> yeah, that makes sense. Thank you. Yeah, sure. Um, I won't tell the story, but um, cod in the Atlantic, same thing. That, that whole story of cod are smaller and smaller and smaller and smaller. They fished the big fish out. There is a social interaction in a population that triggers uh, sexual maturation. Uh, it happens in bluegill, I believe it happens in cod too. If you're a cod and you're swimming around and you're not consciously making the decision, but you're, you're going through that evaluation, am I big enough to be reproductively successful? Looks like I am. Okay, stop growing, start making uh, you know, ovaries uh, or, or sperm and start reproducing. And in fish, the one you switch to adulthood, you, you start growing much slower. And so you can see why you take away the largest individuals out of a population, now the next guys who are, are the males and females are left behind are now the biggest. So they turn on reproduction sooner in their life history and you slowly deplete the size of the fish stock in general. And that's fisheries induced evolution. Okay, it's six o'clock. We're gonna call it quits. It's deer season. All right. I'm going out shining and shooting deer in the middle of the night. Is that legal? Uh, uh, in Illinois, it is not, but I don't know what you guys do up there. Yeah, we do anything in mind. Well, thank you all very much for your attention. Uh, I hope, yeah, I hope you learned something and I really appreciate the invitation.